for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Saturday evening, December the 29th, 1984. Midwinter Family Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Norman Parrish of Guatemala is the speaker of the evening. This is one of two tapes of the Saturday evening service. Well, the Lord's good, and I'm sure that the Lord's not a sourpuss. He enjoys enjoying life with us, or he wouldn't have made us like we are. Amen. To praise the Lord, that's right, and not be a sourpuss. So we can dance and praise the Lord and laugh, and the Lord will be happy and laugh with us. Amen. Well, it's a pleasure to have Brother Norman Parrish back this weekend. Some of you, most of you know him, some of you don't. He's missionary from Guatemala, Central America, and parts of South America. Been there for most of his life. Almost born there, but not quite. But his parents before him were missionaries in Colombia, and he was brought up in that field. But the Lord has given him a ministry, not only to the mission field, but to us back home. Here, this is our home. He makes it home when he comes to the States. His home's always been on the mission field almost. But back in the early years of deliverance, before any of us knew anything about it, the Lord began to move through the deliverance ministry and enlighten Brother Parrish to the demonic world. Now, he was not going to speak on that tonight, I don't think. But he has had many encounters with the principalities and powers of Satan. And uh, one of the very first tapes I ever heard on deliverance <coughs> was a tape that was made in a Baptist oriented minister's conference, I believe, that somebody taped out in the front row or so, and he didn't even know it was being taped. It was an encounter that he was relating to them and the reality of the demonic world, which they didn't want to believe, and he knew it was real but wished it wasn't. But since that time, the Lord has, he has been a help to many, many ministries that the Lord has led his path across, and he's been a great blessing to us, and we appreciate him. And it's a joy to have him with us to minister tonight. Brother Norman Parrish. And the rest of the evening will be his. If it's last night we were somewhere here till 2 o'clock, and the night before I was here till almost 2 also, so we'll see what tonight brings. <laughs> it's been a joy to be back here at Lake Hamilton this weekend. I'm glad I came a day early so I could uh, listen to Brother Charlie Holshauser and Brother Dempsey Thomas and Brother... Oh, Brother Pitt, Howard Pitt. Uh, I always like to uh, listen to other men of God because they've got something to teach, something to share. Uh, we that are in the ministry need to be edified also. Uh, even though we share, we also need to be fed, nurtured, strengthened with might in the inner man by the word and by the spirit. So it's been a really joy to be here uh, with you, and I trust and pray that this camp will uh, come to its conclusion Monday night in real power. That God will do a work in the life of each and every one of us so that when we leave this place, we'll be able to spread the good news of not only salvation, healing, deliverance, but of the full message of the kingdom to the country and then to the world. Hallelujah. Now tonight, let's open our Bibles in Numbers 21. Numbers 21. We'll read from verse 4 down through verse 9. <clears throat> and they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Eden. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. 
And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, I'm sure that everyone here tonight realizes that the message of deliverance, the message of spiritual warfare, can only be understood by divine revelation. Everything we talk about in this camp is a mystery. Either the mystery of godliness or the mystery of iniquity. And ministries can only be understood by the Spirit. There in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1, 2, it says that by revelation we enter into the knowledge of uh, the mysteries of God. So tonight we need our minds to be quickened. We need our eyes to be opened. We need the Spirit to move mightily upon us so that we can understand what the Lord would have us uh, discover in this passage of Scripture. It's a passage of Scripture that has much to teach, much to teach us tonight about spiritual warfare. We are entering into a time in history when the church is going to be besieged by evil spirits as never before. And we need to be prepared. We need, need to be alert because that's the only way we're going to survive. How many want to survive? Amen. How many want to come out victorious Amen. in the years that lie ahead? It's going to take everything that the Lord can give us, every resource, every uh, means available to us through Jesus Christ in order to survive and better still to triumph in these days that lie ahead. Now the Bible here describes one of the many experiences that Israel had as they traveled through the wilderness from Egypt to Canaan. The Bible says that they came to a place um, that was dry, that was waste. It was a desert. There was nothing there for them to eat or to drink. There, was a, there wasn't a well there wasn't a stream, there wasn't an oasis, it was total desert. And because of the, of the long journey that the Israelites had engaged in, they became very, very despondent. The Bible says that they had to go through uh, the land of the Moabites, the Ammonites, in order to arrive at their destination, Canaan. And they asked for permission to go through these different provinces, but they were turned down flat. The king refused to grant them uh, right away. He was afraid that they'd lap up all the water and eat up all the crops. So he said, absolutely not. And the Israelites, in order to not enter into warfare, decided to go around about way. They had to walk many, many miles extra to that uh, horrible place. So naturally, when they arrived at the destination, when the cloud of fire, the cloud of, uh, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud settled, they, uh, they became very, very discouraged. Let me tell you, brethren, tonight that circumstances can affect us in a negative way. And we have to be on our guard. Because the Lord is going to permit certain circumstances to come in our life that will either bring out the best of us or the worst of us. Amen? He's going to bring us to a place where he's going to test us. He's going to try us. He's going to let us to come into adversity to see what is in our heart. So what is in our heart will come to the surface through words and through action. I, uh, we, many times we can't control our circumstances. Have you discovered that? We are not a master over our own circumstances. Many, many things happen in life that we have no control over. Uh, the only thing we can control is our reaction to, in the, towards those circumstances. Amen? We can't control the circumstances, but we certainly can control our reactions to the, those circumstances. And that's the important thing. Because brethren... The circumstances we are going through are ordained of God. How many believe that? Whether they are pleasurable or whether they are unpleasant. All our circumstances are ordained of God. And that's one lesson we should learn early in our Christian life. See, the Israelites journeyed by the direct guidance of the Spirit of God. The Lord moved before them. All they had to do was follow that pillar of cloud or that pillar of fire and the Lord led them in their journey. And so when they came to a place like this, a place of scarcity, a, uh, uh, a place of want, uh, they were in the will of God. And uh, one of the things the Lord has taught me down through the years is to accept uh, the unavoidable. Uh, not resist it, not fight it. Just accept it. And acceptance is peace. When we learn to accept our circumstances, then uh, the peace of God invades our heart. And all that struggle that had been going on within us suddenly disappeared. Amen? Now, did the Israelites accept the circumstances of the moment? No. 
They rebelled, rebelled against things. See, one of the things we have to be very, very careful is of letting ourselves be run down to the point where we become so discouraged with the circumstances of our life. We can have a loss of health, a loss of job, a loss of uh, loved ones. We can, there's many things that can happen unexpectedly, but we should not let them, those things affect us to the point where we lose our strength and our courage. They became discouraged, and that's a point of danger. Uh, we must realize, brethren, that when we are weak physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually, we are at the verge of danger. That means we are, it's a perilous moment when we can do and say foolish things, things that are going to seriously affect our future. We must be on our guard because the enemy is going to egg us on. He's going to incite us to do and say things that will bring upon us what we would call a heap of trouble. And that's exactly what the Israelites did. Now, their circumstances were ordained of God. It's true, God led them to a place where there was no water and where there was no food available except by supernatural provision. And yet, when they arrived at that place after 30, 35, close to 40 years of uh, pilgrimage, they failed miserably. They failed miserably. What did they do? Now, we're going to talk about four points in this message tonight. First, sin committed. Secondly, sin punished. Third, sin confessed. And then finally, sin remedied. Sin committed. Now, what was the sin of Israel? Let's read about it right here in verse 5. And the people spake against God and against Moses. The people spake against. And <laughs> behind every attitude and behind every word that the Israelites displayed in this occasion was a heart full of rebellion towards God. They rebelled against God and against God's delegated authority. They turned against... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> they turned against Moses and against God. Now, they began to blame God and Moses for their, for their circumstances. See? And brethren, we have to be very careful because many times when uh, the Lord places us in, the, in a situation similar to the one the Israelites experienced, we also can rise up against not only God, but the person that God has placed in leadership over us. We can rise up against our husband, or we can rise up against our boss, or we can rise up against our pastor. Uh, we will turn against the person that God has placed in authority over us. And this is very dangerous, because one of the most dreadful sins we can commit is rebellion. I don't think we've been taught enough about rebellion in uh, our churches uh, today. Rebellion is a sin that brings dire results. Uh, and yet, uh, I would say uh, a large percentage of us that are here tonight, and I include myself in the list, have been guilty of rebellion, of rebellious attitudes. When we rebel against uh, circumstances, we are actually rebelling against God. When we rebel against uh, leaders, we are actually rebelling against God. And so we have to be very careful, brethren, because rebellion uh, is a sin that brings upon ourselves uh, much harm. And we'll see that tonight. So first of all, it says here, and the people spake <coughs> against God and against Moses. Uh, you can read in the scriptures that many, many times men and women spoke against those that God had placed in leaders, against judges and kings and priests and prophets. We have one case here in the book of Numbers in chapter 12. You remember that Miriam and Aaron rose up against Moses. Moses was God's leader. Thank you. God had placed Moses in a position of leadership. He was not there out of his own choice. Moses had done nothing to assume that position of leadership. God had raised him up. God had exalted him. God had placed him in uh, that position from, from which he could exert uh, rulership over the people of God. But Miriam and Aaron were jealous, and they took advantage of one of Moses' mistakes to turn against him. Now, just read Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. What was Moses' mistake? Moses went off and, and married a heathen. Now, this was not, it was not his first marriage. This was his second marriage. 30, 40 years before he had married uh, a Midianite. He had married uh, Jethro, Jethro's daughter, uh, Jethro the priest's daughter, and uh, God had put his, his sanction, had put his approval upon that marriage. But now, many, many years later, he met a, an Ethiopian. Probably she was from a different nationality. She was probably from a different race. Some have even said that she was black. 
uh, that really doesn't matter tonight. I'm just, the, what I'm stating is that Moses m- m- committed a mistake not in marrying a foreigner, not in marrying a black. His mistake was that he was <coughs> violating principles that God had given his people through his mediation. God had set down some laws that the Israelites should not intermarry with people of heathen races or of heathen nations. God wanted to keep that nation pure. And he violated the very laws that God had given through his own mouth. And so Miriam and Aaron took advantage of this circumstance to rise up against them. It was an excuse. And brother, let me tell you something. Your husband's mistakes do not authorize you to rise up against him. Your pastor's mistakes don't authorize you to rise up against him. And people in leadership are going to make mistakes. How many believe that? Uh, but that does not authorize anybody to rise up against him. That is not an acceptable or justifiable reason for you to rise up against the person that is in position of leadership. Now, what happened? Well, God was zealous for his servant. And Miriam came down with a, uh, one of the most serious illnesses that people uh, suffered back in those olden days. Today, everybody dreads cancer. Back then, everybody dreaded, dreaded leprosy. She became leprous from head to foot. Now, why did God strike Miriam and he didn't strike Aaron? I'm sure you, you've uh, read this passage before and you arrived at your own conclusion. She was the instigator. <coughs> Aaron was always weak. Aaron was pliable. Uh, Aaron was, uh, had always been easy to persuade and easy to influence. And so Miriam was behind the scenes instigating this act of rebellion against Moses. And she was the one that suffered uh, divine wrath. She was the one that suffered the consequences of this act of rebellion against Moses, the one that was in leadership. Let me tell you, brethren, no matter what mistakes that people make that are in positions of leadership, that does not give you the right to rise up against him. Why is it so quiet here tonight? Huh? Are you disagreeing with me? Or are you just meditating? Or are you remembering some occasion when you rose up against someone in leadership just because he or she made a mistake? Huh? Well, I don't have a lot of time tonight to really go into the story. But the, one of the things that you're going to learn is that if you want to be restored, you're going to have to go to the person you maligned, you defamed, you criticized. You're going to have to go to him to get help. You're not going to get it anywhere else. Miriam had to go to Moses and Mo- uh, so that Moses could minister to her. Her restoration to full health depended on Moses' prayer. Amen? Amen? And I've discovered down through the years in ministry, in the healing ministry and deliverance ministry, that those that have come under divine judgment because they have risen up against somebody in authority are going to have to go directly to that person for help. I remember in Guatemala years ago, uh, a certain minister rose up against me. He was he belonged to our own fellowship, and he began to attack me publicly and privately. In one of our business meetings, he stood up and he accused me of a lot of things that were not true. He came down with cancer. I refused to defend myself. I never defended myself. Uh, I, I learned many years ago that God is my defense. If God won't justify, if God won't vindicate, I'd be wasting my time trying to do that, do so. <laughs> so I just left the little thing in God's hands. And it wasn't too much too uh, much longer later that the man came down with cancer. Well, he should have come to me. He should have come and asked for forgiveness. But you know what he did? First he went to medical doctors. They opened him up and sold him up. Sent him home to die. The cancer had spread through his bowels. Uh, it had already invaded the liver and uh, the stomach and other parts of his, uh, uh, some of the basic organs. So he, they sent him home to die. And you know, instead of repenting, and still, instead of humbling himself and coming to ask for prayer and assistance, he went to a witch doctor. And they gave, he gave him some brews, uh, some of those, uh, uh, some bottles of some uh, foul-smelling stuff. And the man took this, and I'll tell you, brethren, perhaps I've never heard or known of a person that had died in greater agony than this pastor died. Nothing helped him. For a week or for ten days before he died, he was in sheer agony day and night. No medication would, would uh, take away the pain. Why? Because uh, he would refuse to humble himself and come and seek for the help that he needed. 
And brethren, let me tell you something. Be careful when, you, when and how you open your mouths to criticize somebody that God has placed in authority. If he is God's delegated authority in a certain uh, sphere of action, in the home or in the school or in the church or in the society, you keep your mouth shut. Huh? If you have any grievances, take them to the Lord. Pray for the man. If the Lord will lead you, you confront the man himself. If necessary, take witnesses with you. If necessary, go to the people that are over authority, uh, in authority over him. But never go talking behind his back. Amen? That's gossip. And you're going to get into a heap of trouble if you do that. Huh? Because God is zealous of his servants. Uh, you cannot touch God's anointed and not suffer the consequences. Amen? Okay, let's go back to chapter 21. <coughs> To speak against or rise against a man that's in authority is an act of rebellion. You can see that here in chapter 20. I'll read just the verse for you. In chapter 2 it says, And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. <clears throat> verse 3, And the people chode with Moses in spake saying. Notice what, what uh, Moses said about them here in verse 10. Moses and Aaron gathered, gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now ye rebels. When they rose up against Moses and Aaron, when they spoke against him, when they chided him or chode him, what were they doing? They were revealing a heart full of rebellion. And rebellion is a sin that will not only destroy your body, but damn your soul. Amen? What is the spirit of, of this age? Rebellion. Rebellion in every sphere of society. You find rebellion in the home, in the school, at the job, uh, everywhere. Rebellion. It's, it's permeated society. And the sad thing is, brethren, that in the church, we, uh, there's rebellion all the way from the pulpit down to the pew. Amen? We don't want to recognize authority. We don't want to respect authority. We don't want to submit to anybody. And there's an independent spirit. Uh, this is the spirit of the age, of doing your own thing. Living whatever way you choose to live. You don't want anybody to correct you. You don't want anybody to discipline. You don't want anybody to tell you, what to do or where to go or how to live. That's rebellion. Amen? So what was the sin of Israel? Rebellion. Now, rebellion has many, many different ways. Uh, it manifests in many, many different ways. And we can see it by the way the Israelites spoke about Moses and about, their, about God here in verse 5. In this chapter 21, verse 5. And the people spake against God and against Moses, saying, <clears throat> Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Now, you'll notice several things here. We're just analyzing uh, this sinful condition of the people of Israel. Why did you bring us out of Israel? One of the things I've learned, brethren, and I've learned by sad and painful experience, is that we should never ask God why. Huh? Why? Huh? Because when we say, why, Lord? We're not only questioning, we're not only doubting, we're demanding an explanation. And God is not obligated to explain to us his dealing in our lives. Amen? God's not obligated to. One of the things God wants us to learn is to trust him blindly with our lives, with our future. Amen? If God permitted it, if God ordained it, it's all right. I accept it. Huh? Because I know that according to the scriptures, no matter how bad it might seem, it is going to be turned around for good. All things work together for good. How many believe that? And if eventually, even what seems so evil and so damnable in our life is going to be turned around for good, what should we do? Wait quietly. Wait quietly before God. Just trust Him. You know, there's great emphasis on faith in the body of Christ today. Well, there's, there's a faith movement all through the country. Faith churches are springing up everywhere. But there's something greater than faith. And you know what that is? Trust. Huh? There comes a time in life when you can't exercise faith any longer. All you can do is just trust. I remember when I used to... I was an asthmatic for many, many years. Uh, I suffered from asthma, I guess it was, for 30 years or more. And three, four, five times a year I'd come down with this de deadly attack of asthma. It would settle in my chest, and for a week, for ten days, I'd be bedridden. And I had to gulp for every breath of air that came into my chest. I had that kind of congestive asthma, or that bronchial asthma. My lungs would fill up with flames. 
so that it was impossible to breathe. Well, before I came into the, uh, an experience of divine healing, uh, I, I tried every medicine uh, on, on the market. Uh, I, never, I, dared, I, I never dared leave my home on a trip without my little medicine kit. I had all kinds of pills and potions. In fact, I was injected more antibiotics by mistake because they really didn't help me any. Uh, for years, I was taking all kinds of penicillin and pills and der derivatives, uh, but they, they didn't help me. But in 1962, I, we discovered the truth about divine healing and health. And I think I've given my testimony here before. My wife and I decided to get rid of all our medicine. Well, I thought the Lord would heal me uh, instantaneously. I, I was such a courageous act of faith. I thought the Lord would. We flushed our medicine down the, the toilet, the commode. And uh, I, I can say today without any... Uh, bluster without any uh, bragging that for 22 years I haven't even had an aspirin go through my mouth. I refused to take medicine. I decided 22 years ago to trust God for my health, for life, or for death. Did you hear that? Did you think I was healed immediately? No. <laughs> I had 12 years of, of battle from 1962 to 1974. And these attacks would intensify many many times I was at the verge of death death rows and you know when you're in that condition with a fever, raging fever you're delirious with pain with ex, um, choking every symptom of every disease can you exercise faith no you can't exercise faith. all you can do is trust God with your life and I would lie there and I said Lord I trust you Whatever you want to do with me, if you want to preserve my life, fine. If you want to take me home, fine. Just trust. And brethren, that's something we have to learn if we are going to be successful in Christian living. Back in the Old Testament, one of the uh, <coughs> minor prophets that says that God knows them that trust him. God knows them that trust him. And God certainly wants us to develop faith, not only faith, but trust in him. Trust is something deeper than faith. It's more profound. It's more lasting. Because you can come into a place in your Christian life where you're not going to be able to exercise faith actively. All you can do is trust God with air, with your life, with your soul, with everything you have. Amen? Now, were the Israelites trusting God? No. They were saying, why? Why does this happen to us? Why did you permit this to happen? Why did you bring us to this awful place? Let me suggest, brethren, tonight, eliminate that little question from your vocabulary. Never ask God why. Because it shows a lack of trust in God's providence, a lack of, God, of trust in God's purpose for your life. Amen? Now, they didn't only stop there. They said, why did you bring us out of Egypt? <laughs> Boy, their memory is short. Why did, it, why did God bring them out of Egypt? Uh, because they asked him to. God didn't force him out of Egypt. God intervened in Egypt because they asked him to. Okay? And many times God intervenes in our lives and then we turn against the Lord. And we say, why did you do it, Lord? Wouldn't it be better if we would be better off if you had never meddled in our affairs? Yeah. Now notice the third, third thing it says there. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to die? Now, actually, they were accusing God of bringing them out of Egypt to kill them there in the desert. In fact, they worded it. Back here in, uh, <coughs> back here in chapter 16, verse 12, that's exactly what they said. Verse 13. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of a land that flows with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? What were they accusing God and Moses of doing? Of deliberate of a deliberate plan, of a premeditated plan to bring an entire nation to a wilderness to kill them up. They were accusing God of cruelty. They were accusing God of sadism. They were accusing God of trying to execute a massacre right there in the desert. Genocide. Holocaust. Cause. Whatever you want to call it. Uh -huh. Now, that's why I tell you, say, just be careful what you say when you are depressed. When, you, when you're down on yourself. When you're down on others. When you're down on God and in God's appointed leadership. Because you can say things that reveal uh, some ugly dispositions of the heart. They were accusing God 
of trying to wipe out an entire nation. They were calling God a murderer. And that's an affront to a holy God. Amen? To a loving God. Are you still with me? Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. Let me ask you, was there any bread? Was there any water? Did they, did they suffer from hunger and thirst one day during the 40 years that they walked through the wilderness? God provided supernaturally. When they needed bread, what did God rain upon them? Manna. And when they needed water, what did God provide? Water from the rock. So there was an abundance. There was manna, which was one of the most nutritious foods ever created. Amen. It was showered down upon them from heaven. Uh, we don't have much time to talk about this tonight. But there in Psalm 78, and I think it was Brother Thomas that spoke to us from that psalm today, it's called, man is called angels' food. The food of, of nobles. The food of angels. Uh, it was angel food that had been materialized so that the Israelites could consume it. It was so nutritious that the Israelites neither became feeble, neither became sick during the 40 years of pilgrimage. Amen? You are what you eat. If you eat junk foods, you're going to get sick and die. Huh? Isn't that true? This food was so full of vitamins and minerals and proteins and carbohydrates. It had everything that was needed to live a healthy, happy life. And yet they got, they got tired of it. They said neither is the food, neither is the water. They were actually, not only exaggerating, they were lying. Outright lies. Can you see all the sins that the Israelites were committing? There was rebellion. There was murmuring. There was an accusation. There was lying. There's all kinds of things manifested just through the few words that came out of their mouth. Now, then it goes on to say, and our soul loathes this uh, light bread. Loathing. What's that? Hatred. Hatred. We hate this food. We can't stand it any longer. We're fed up. We want a change of diet. Uh, we, we, they were always remembering the garlic and they were remembering the cucumbers. They were remembering all the food that they had consumed back in Egypt. They were tired of the manna. Now, that's strange, brethren. Because according to Exodus 16, the first time that the Israelites tasted manna, they were just absolutely <coughs> enthralled. Let's go to Exodus chapter 16. What does it say there? In verse 31. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. When they first tasted the manna, what did it taste like? Oh, it was a delicacy, wasn't it? Just like dessert. Uh, it was like some kind of pastry. Wafers with honey. It's something that you eat after the main course. It's like uh, dessert. Down in Guatemala, uh, where I live, on Sundays and holidays, uh, certain women go through the town with a big basket, a straw basket on the head, and they have these big wafers and bottles of honey. And, and the, if you stop them, they'll lower the basket, and they'll take one of these wafers and just pour honey all over it. Exactly like... It says here, it, people buy it as a, as a treat. That's actually what it is. Something, it's not something they eat daily. It's something that they eat on special occasions. Now, let's go to Numbers chapter 11 and see what their attitude was after 30, 40 years. Numbers chapter 11. <coughs> and we'll read verse 7 and 8. The manna was as coriander seed and the color thereof as the color of delium. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills and beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the, as the taste of fresh oil. Things certainly changed, didn't it? And at the beginning, it had the taste of what? Honey. And after, after 30, 40 years, it had the taste of what? Fresh oil. Now, I, let me ask you, did the manna change? No. It was the same old manna. What had changed? Their palate. The t their taste bud. They got, they got tired of it, so they, instead of being a delicacy, instead of being a treat, it became just like worm medicine to them. Huh? When I was a kid in Colombia, my parents would feed me worm medicine every six months. Uh, where, we grew, where I grew up, we had everything. Uh, we had lice in our hair. Uh, we had what we call niguas. I don't know if you ever heard of those, but they get under our, uh, our toes. What do you call them here? Jiggers. Okay. You had some, didn't you, sister? Huh? And boy, they were painful. And uh, every six months, religiously, my parents would feed us some worm medicine. It was a thick oil and uh, with a nauseating smell and taste. And when we knew that the time was uh, coming for that worm medicine, we'd avoid our parents. We'd try to keep away from We'd try to leave home early in the morning, not come back till late at night. 
and they'd have, finally my dad would grab us and sit on us and uh, put our his uh, big fat hand over our mouth so that I mean nose and so that we'd have to open our mouth and then mother would pour that flask full of that thick oil into our mouth and I tell you when it hit our stomach all hell broke loose because those were it was effective those worms started fleeing through every orifice of the body now now notice what happened a manna to them was just like honey but 30 40 years of eating manna it became old and trite what did it become to them just like a, a medicine like worm medicine it, it, it developed, they developed like a nauseating taste towards it let me ask you brother when you first come into the baptism aren't things wonderful uh, how excited you are you don't miss a service you're there early, you come to pray, you come to, to clap, you have a great time, Lord. You sit right here in the fuse, first few, few fuse, and you're stuck. Just like a little bird, you know, just drinking it all. You're in trance. But now where are you sitting? Way back there in the back row. Huh? <laughs> What's changed? Has the Holy Ghost changed? Has the Holy Writ changed? What has changed? You've changed. Your attitude towards the things of God has changed. You've lost interest. It doesn't appeal to you. It doesn't enthrall you. It doesn't fill you like it did at the beginning. Amen? That's exactly what happened to the Israelites. They, they turned against God's provision for their, not only subsistence, but survival. And brethren, many times that was what we do after years of walking in the Christian path. Huh? After being born again, after being spirit-filled, we turn against the things that God has provided for us because we just get super saturated. We get so, the show, we read so many books and we listen to so many tapes that we're up to here. We can't stand it any longer. And be careful because that's the moment when we can bring, bring upon ourselves all kinds of tribulations that are, our just reward for the attitudes that we have assumed against God, towards God and towards God's divine provision. Okay, do you see the series of sins that the Israelites committed? All the way from rebellion, through murmuration, through ingratitude, through discontent, through uh, uh, rejection, etc., etc., etc. Now, all of these sins are grievous in the sight of God. Today, we don't call many things uh, that the Bible calls sins. We just refuse to call them sins. We don't call them a quirk. We'll call them a mistake. We'll call them a weakness. We'll call them anything instead of calling them sin. Let me ask you, is ingratitude sin? We're going to study about that tomorrow. Is murmuring sin? Is rebellion sin? Yeah, we're going to study about some of the sins that cause physical and emotional infirmities tomorrow. <coughs> but let me tell you something, brethren. When we indulge in sin, no matter what the sin might be, we are going to have to suffer the consequences. There's a penalty toward sin, isn't there? The Bible says that the wages of sin are death, but the road to death can be what? Misery and suffering and illness. Uh, there are many things that come into our life as a result of sin that lead ultimately up to death. Now, before we're going to get relief, before we're going to get help, we're going to have to recognize our sin and rid ourselves of it. And I believe, brethren, that one of the reasons why the deliverance ministry has not been as effective as it should be is because we haven't emphasized what Brother, uh, here I go again, Pittman was saying this afternoon. We haven't emphasized what? Repentance. 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 Amen? Okay, let's go on to verse 6. First we saw the sin committed, now we're going to see the sin punished. How did God deal with that sin? He dealt with that sin the way he always deals with sin. And this is going to be very interesting. Just, let's turn uh, again to verse 6 and it says, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. The Lord sent fiery serpents, poisonous serpents. Now where did these serpents come from? Huh? They came from God. God sent them. God released them upon his own people. And you know, I for years was troubled with certain passages of Scripture that we're going to mention or we're going to read tonight because I didn't really understand stood what was going on. Now, how many believe that God's in control of everything? Is God in control of Satan and his demonic hosts? Huh? Does Satan do anything behind his back? 
If Satan does anything to us, to our family, to our community, to our church, it's because God either ordained it or permitted it. Amen? Satan never, never does anything without first going through God. Huh? Oh, that means that if, if we are troubled by evil spirits, it's because God somehow or another was forced to permit Satan to attack us or to oppress us or to harass us because of our sin. Sin is the doorway. Sin opens the door to demonic activity. Uh, and you, you should be absolutely certain, my dear brother or sister, that if you are plagued by evil spirits, it's either because of your sin or the sin of your ancestors. And it's time you realize this and you confess this. That's why before, I, I, I refuse to lay hands lightly on any man. In fact, I prefer to not pray for anybody unless I have a chance to sit down and talk with that person and counsel with that person. I want to go to the root of the matter. I want to find out the cause of that condition. The Bible says that the curse cometh not but with a cause. That's in uh, Proverbs 26, 2, I think it is. Uh, the curse shall causeless not come. That means that if we, we, we are plagued by evil spirits, the evil spirits are affecting our health and our finance and our home, it's because, brethren, we have opened the door to the operation of evil spirits through our sin. And if we would deal with our sin, and if we would deal severely <coughs> with our sin, we would leave, need much less deliverance than we're getting today. When I pray for somebody and I'm not getting the results I expect, I just stop. And I... Uh, I do everything I can do to get that person to come face to face with their sin. There are sins that we have committed that we have repressed. And we've done the, our best to forget. And they're hidden some way back in the deep recesses of our mind. And we don't want to confront them. We don't want to confess them. Huh? But let me tell you, brethren, as long as we don't come face to face with our sin, we are wasting our time and wasting the time of those that are ministering to us. When the battle goes on hour after hour and day after day and week after week, it's because there are, the demons are, have found a handle in, on us, in us. Uh, they're holding on. They're grasping on to something in our life that we don't want to release. Amen? And it's time, brother, that we, came, uh, we were honest with ourselves and honest with God, and we began to call sin by its name. Now, one of the disservices that has been done to us by the holiness movement. And I praise God for what God did through the holiness movement back in, in the 19th century. Because holiness led to Pentecost. And, and it, uh, but one of the things was that they, the holiness people claimed to get so sanctified that they could no longer sin. What we call sinless perfection. Sin was absolutely wiped out of their lives. Uh, and what happened after that? Whenever they did something that was wrong, they wouldn't call it a sin, they would call it what? A weakness. Huh? A mistake. A deficiency. But never call it sin. And brethren, that brought defeat and, and ultimately destruction to the lives of many people. I think we need to call a spade a spade. Amen? Amen. If God calls fear a sin, we should call it sin. Huh? If God calls the rebellion sin, we should call it sin. And the sooner we call it by its rightful name, the sooner we're going to get the help that we need. So that's Amen? Okay, what happened? Sin opened the door to the operation of evil spirits. How many know that serpents in the Bibles are symbols of evil spirits? Uh, have you found verses that would confirm this? Uh, Luke ten thirteen. Behold, I give you power to tread upon serpents and upon scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Uh, uh, Revelation chapter 12. Talks about that old serpent, that, that 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 dragon, that old serpent that is called what? Satan and the devil. There are many, many scriptures, in the, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, that identify serpents with Satan and his cohort. Amen. So these, when when these serpents were sent into the camp, they were actually symbols of said the demons that were invading the lives of the Israelites. Amen. And they were deadly. Because the Bible says that they bit many people and many people died. Young and old. Uh, rich and poor. Learned and ignorant. It didn't matter what they, who they were or what they were. If they were bitten by those serpents, they died. There was no antidote to that poison. There is no way that poison could be counteracted. Or that poison could be combated. 
uh, they died. It was just the, a death sentence upon them when one of these serpents bit them. Amen. Now, where did the serpents come from? We're, we're not finished with that. Uh, let's read it here in <coughs> Judges chapter 9, verse 23. You'd be surprised how many of those demons that are troubling you tonight have been sent of God. Hmm? Because of our traditional beliefs, it's very hard to accept. Uh, I'm, I'm a literalist. I take the word, word of God at face value. I believe that God says what he means. And we don't have to go around interpreting the scriptures or <laughs> disannulling the scriptures. Oh, uh, many of us are trying to, uh, we, we excuse God. Uh, we're calling God an ignoramus. And God really didn't know what he was saying. And so we kind of twist it, or the scriptures around a little bit, so it doesn't sound so so uh, drastic to the human mind. But just notice what Jude chapter 9, Judges chapter 9, did I say Jude? Judges chapter 9 verse 23 says, Then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Sechem, and the men of Sechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. Who sent this demon? As an act of divine judgment upon Abimelech and upon the men of Sechem. Now why? Well, you remember the story? Gideon had how many children? Seventy children. And when Gideon died, Abimelech, who was the son of Gideon, but by, with a, a heathen woman, with a, a, woman, or a woman of, uh, what, what do we call that? Uh, not, not a legitimate wife. What was she? A concubine. Abimelech got ambitious, and he uh, grasped for power. He wanted to become the ruler, the king. And so nobody did. Nobody did. He went and killed off the seventy sons of Gideon. Only one was spared. And that was the, one of the smallest. That was Jotham. He hid. And when he had a, the first opportunity, he had he he pronounced a curse upon Abimelech. And if you want to read the whole story, you can read chapter nine before you go to bed tonight. Okay. But he pronounced a curse upon Abimelech and upon the men of Sechem. And the curse was, the curse was soon fulfilled because the Bible says that God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech the king and the men of Sechem. And there, there, a rift was, was created between them. Um, they began to be suspicious of each other. Uh, the, the men of Sechem dealt treacherously. They betrayed. They became traitorous in their attitude towards their king, towards Abimelech. Now, in the following verse, in verse 24, it says, why? Because of the cruelty of Abimelech with the sons of Gideon. Because of his cruelty, because of his wickedness, actually Abimelech attracted these evil spirits, opened himself up to the operation of these evil spirits, and this led to his defeat and to his death. Now, who sent these demons? God sent them. Huh? It was an act of divine judgment. And let me tell you, brethren, a lot of... Christians, even today, are under divine judgment because of sin. God deals with sin in a Christian's life the same way he deals with sin in a heathen's life. Uh, in fact, I think God is more drastic, more severe with his people than he is with the people that have no knowledge of God. Amen. And if sin opens a wedge for demons in the life of those that are outside the fold, much more it opens a wedge in the life of those that are inside the fold. Amen. If you tolerate sin in your life, you are going to become highly demonized. There's no way of, around it. Amen? Whatever your sin, the sin, your besetting sin, the sin that you have tolerated, that you have hidden in your spirit, that sin is going to open the door to evil spirits. Amen? Okay, and those evil spirits are going to come sent of God. They're going to be judgment punishment of God upon your sinful way of life. Now, let's go to 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verse 14. Here's another case. <coughs> what does it say there in verse 14? But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now, where did this evil spirit come from? From the Lord. The Lord sent him. And it was an act of thine judgment upon Saul, because he had rebelled not only once, but twice against God. He had rebelled against God's delegated authority. God had given him plain instruction through Samuel. And yet, not only once, but twice, he had rebelled against Samuel and thus against God. And so the Spirit of the Lord departed and he was a sitting, what do you call it, sitting duck? Huh? To evil spirits. See, our only protection is what? The anointing. The fullness of the Spirit. And when the Spirit of God withdrew from Saul, he was... Uh, Exposed. He was open. He was available. 
to any kind of demonic operation. The Bible says that an evil spirit came and harassed him, tormented him, vexed him. This demon absolutely drove him crazy. He became a raving maniac. He had murderous instincts. He tried to kill his son. He tried to kill his son-in-law. And all this was punishment, was judgment upon him because of what? Of rebellion. Amen? Where do demons come from? Huh? From God. Huh? How many have heard that before? Uh, no, we don't like to hear that. We've tried to explain it away some other way. But actually, brethren, when we sin, especially if we commit a, a, a sin of rebellion, we are opening ourselves up to the evil spirit that will come not sent by Satan, but sent by God himself. Now, let's go to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 17, 11. An evil man seeketh only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. See the word sent there again? An evil man seeketh only rebellion. Other versions say that an evil man seek only seeks his own hurt, his own harm. A rebel is only hurting himself. How many believe that? When you rebel, you're not hurting anybody else but yourself. Huh? And the Bible says that a cruel messenger, and the word messenger is the word that we would translate ordinarily angel. A cruel angel, an evil angel, shall be sent against him. Now, who's going to send that evil angel, that cruel angel, against the rebel? Will it be Satan? No, sir. God himself will send. And that evil spirit will not get off your back till you repent of your sin. Did you hear that? And you can go through one in a thousand deliverances. You can go across the country from one deliverance seminar or workshop to another. You can go to Hagwich. You can go to Whitney Point. You can go to Long Island. You can go to <coughs> Burbank. You can go wherever you want to go and get prayed by every deliverance minister in the country and you won't find relief and you won't find freedom until you repent of your sin. Huh? So don't waste your money and don't waste your time running around the country seeking for deliverance until you're ready to give up your sin. Huh? Because those demons are there by divine appointment and they're not going to leave except by divine command. Amen? So the difference, be the difference between bondage and freedom is what? Repentance. And I want to emphasize that tonight. Because I've been to churches, I've been to camps where the same people are going through deliverance time after time after time and after time. I get wearied of it. And you know why? Because they're not willing to give up their meanness. And they're not willing to give up their sin. And they're holding on to their rebellious ways. They're rebellion to their husband. They're rebellion to their pastor. They're in re rebellion in to their, uh, their boss. They're re in rebellion to every authority symbol. And how are they going to get free? Impossible. Boy, it's quiet here tonight. Huh? Okay? Now, we're not finished yet. Let's go back to the book of Psalms. Psalm 78. Verse 49, it says, He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. Now, it's talking about here, about Egypt, about Pharaoh and Egypt. And how did God punish Egypt? By sending what? Evil angels among them. Who caused all the plagues of Egypt? Yeah. But by the intervention of demonic spirits. Amen? Demons were loosed, were released upon Egypt. And those demons came and caused the boils and caused the locusts and caused every plague that we have called the ten plagues of Egypt. Amen? Now notice that they were sent by God to punish a rebellious nation. Pharaoh hardened his heart against God. He was stiff-necked. He was stubborn. He would not yield. He would not submit to God. And what happened? Because of that, he and his people suffered loss and death. Amen? And behind all these plagues, evil spirits were operating. Now, let's go to the book of Joel. If I haven't convinced you so far, well, let's see if I can convince you with Joel. <clears throat> How many can say amen tonight? Amen. If you can't say amen, say oh me. Okay? Here in chapter 1, it says in verse 4, That which the palmer worm hath, hath left, hath the locust eaten. That which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. That which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Now, here it's talking about four different types of insects. And we don't have time tonight to go into this. But these insects attack the trees, the fruit, fruit trees especially, and they destroy the leaves, the flowers, 
the the twigs, the the bark, everything. They leave the tree absolutely what? There. That's what the, the Joel chapter one says in verse five, six, and seven. You can read it uh, later. But brethren, where did these l- insects, these uh, worms, come from? They are also symbol of evil spirits because it's talking here about God's people, Israel, and we are spiritual Israel. How many believe that? It's talking about the vineyard, and the vineyard uh, is the symbol of the church. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. Uh, and uh, then let's go to chapter two. Verse uh, 25, And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the baltimore worm, my great army that I sent. Who sent these insects? Who sent these worms? God sent them against his own people. And they ate up all the strength and all the vitality of his people. The people were laid bare. They, these, these insects, these worms, spoiled the vineyard. <laughs> they absolutely ate up everything of any use or any value in the vineyard. The, 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 the vine was left stripped, bare. Brethren, that's the condition of the church. If you read church history, you'll find that after the first, second century, the church began to go down spiritually. It lost all the graces and all the gifts of the Holy Ghost. It became instant, institutionalized. It became the official church of the Roman Empire. And every trace of power and glory that had ever existed in the church disappeared. No. This is the end of part A. Please play Part B. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Saturday evening. December the 29th, 1984. Midwinter Family Camp Meeting, being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Norman Parrish of Guatemala is the speaker of the evening. This is now the conclusion of this message from Part A. Of December the 29th, 1984, with Norman Parrish. This is tape two of two tapes of the Saturday evening service. In every trace of power and glory, that had ever existed in the church disappeared down through the Middle Ages. Now, the restoration started with Luther and with Calvin and with all these great reformers. But, brethren, the restitution and the restoration is not ended yet. How many believe that? Uh, you think deliverance is the end? You poor, benighted soul. Uh, deliverance is not the end. Uh, I, I've been tempted to preach a message on deliverance and sonship. The only purpose of deliverance is to lead you into sonship. There can be no sonship without deliverance. And it's sad to say a lot of sonship people reject deliverance and a lot of deliverance people reject sonship. Huh? Did you know that? Uh, you Just read Galatians chapter 4 uh, uh, and you'll find the relationship between deliverance and sonship. Especially if you read the Revised Standard Version or you read, you read the Amplified or some other versions, you'll find there that it talks about the elemental spirits of the world that operate in carnal Christians. And you won't come into maturity. You won't come into perfection. You won't come into... Pro- and the sonship until you are set free of these elemental spirits. Amen? Uh, but, but the problem is today that a lot of Christians think that what they've got is the ultimate. Uh, they think they've arrived. Uh, I've come into healing, I've come into deliverance, I've come into this, and that's the end of the road. Brethren, you're just starting. Uh, there's a long way to go yet. And you better keep open and pliable to God or you're going to be left by the wayside. You'll be, you'll become a part of the trash heap of history. You'll be, your bones will uh, be bleached, bleaching in the sun, because you were not willing to go all the way with God. Amen? So let me ask you, what is God's judgment upon sin? Demons. Did you know that? God judges sin by unleashing or loosing evil spirits upon you. And many of your demonic problems tonight, brethren, are, uh, are taking place because you have refused to submit to God. You refuse to obey. You refuse to adjust your life to the Word of God. You refuse to live a life of righteousness and holiness in the sight of God. And that sin has opened the way to an operation or an influx of evil spirits. And those spirits are driving you crazy. You're losing your, your health, your strength, your courage. You're absolutely being besieged by evil spirits. And all because of what? Sin. Amen? 
See, sin has to be punished. Sin has to be corrected. God cannot, does never take sin lightly. He never dismisses sin. God only forgives sin when you confess it, when you repent. Huh? If you ignore your sin, if you hide your sin, the longer you wait, the, wor the deeper these evil spirits are going to take root in you. And then it's going to be harder and harder for you to get deliverance. There's another message I've been working on based on ne uh, Nehemiah chapter 9 where it says that God delivered his people into the hand of the enemy. That's similar to what we're talking about tonight. When you sin, God will deliver you into the hand of the enemy. Amen? And those spirits won't stop hounding you and harassing you until you repent before God. Okay, now let's see what the Bible says about the, the third point. Let's go back to Numbers chapter 21. Really, I'm not doing justice to this message tonight, but I think you're getting the, uh, at least the idea, aren't you? Now, verse 7. Where, therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. Therefore, that's an adverb of, of some kind or another. Maybe it's an adverb of time or occasion. But it says, Therefore, when the people saw that their children and their grandchildren were dropping dead, they were dropping everywhere like flies, what did they do? They came to Moses and said, We have sinned. It's just like us, isn't it? Uh, we'll ignore our sin, we'll tolerate our sin until unpleasant things begin to happen. And then what we will do? We'll come to our senses and we'll begin to realize that we have brought this upon ourselves and then we will come and confess. Why did we wait so long? Uh, don't you think the Spirit of God has been given to convict us, to reprove us? And I'll tell you something, the moment you sin, that very moment the Spirit of God deals with you. Uh, he doesn't wait for a week or a month or a year. He begins to deal you immediately. But what do you do ordinarily? Ignore the voice of the Spirit until the voice of the Spirit begins, gets weaker and weaker and weaker and it dies out. And when that happens, then God sticks those demons on you. Hmm? And you begin to experience all kind of pain and all kind of anguish and suddenly you wake up the fact that <laughs> you have sinned against God. Why wait so long? Why wait so long? That's why the Bible says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. If you got angry during the course of the day, if you had a spat with your wife or with your son, what should you do? Get that thing settled before you go to bed. The Bible says that while men slept, the enemy sowed the terror. And it's during the night time that demons are most active. And you're, if you're asleep and there is sin in your heart, if you're angry and you're bitter, you're, you're just open to any kind of evil spirit that might be floating through the air. You're just like a pigeon uh, house. Demons will come in and out at, at, at large. They can do whatever they want with you because the sin has opened you up to their presence and to their operation. Amen? Now, the Israelites came and said to Moses, Moses, we have sinned. Now, is confession of sin always a sign of repentance? No. It's a part of repentance, but it's not the only evidence of that you have repented. Now, I've got a number of instances here in the written down of men or in the Bible that said they had sinned, but they kept on sinning. Cain said he had sinned. Oh, my sin is too great to be forgiven. Huh? He recognized that he had sinned. He knew that his sin was great, that was grievous in the sight of God, but he was not willing to give it up. Amen? Did Balaam confess his sin when the angel of the Lord appeared before him with his sword drawn? What did Balaam say? I have sinned. Now, it seemed evil to you. I'll turn around and go home. And what did the angel say? Well, uh, you still want to go? Go your way. He got out of the way. He said, okay, keep on. Because he, he, he discerned in Balaam's heart that he was just as determined as ever to go and do what he wanted to do. Amen? Did Achan confess his sin? After he, he stole that uh, gold bar, after he stole that Persian rug, what did he say? I have sinned. But did that spare him from death? No. There are many men in the Bible that confessed their sins, but they never repented. Amen? See, confession is a step towards repentance. Amen? Now, if I had time tonight, I'd give you all, uh, go into the scripture, and you can see that, first of all, in repentance, there's a conviction of sin. The Spirit of God comes and reproves you. You feel pierced at the heart. 
You suddenly wake up and realize that you have sinned against God. The Spirit of God makes you aware of your sin, but that's not enough. <coughs> After conviction comes remorse. Amen? What's remorse? Godly sorrow. You feel sorry for your sin. You feel bad because you have sinned against God. You feel uh, a, a deep uh, sorrow in your heart for having done that which you knew that was wrong in the sight of God. But is that repentance? Conviction and remorse are not repentance. Then confession. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Amen? But that's not enough. Conviction, remorse, confession are not the end. What is the end? What, what's the proof of the pudding? Uh, when you renounce your sin, when you turn your back on your, your back on your sin, when you give your sin up, that's repentance. Amen? Because it's a change of mind. It's a change of attitude towards sin. How many know Proverbs 28, 13 by memory? Huh? Can somebody speak it out? We should know these scriptures. I know my scripture in Spanish. I have a little problem uh, re reciting it in English. But what does Proverbs 28, 13 say? He that covers his sin shall not prosper. Uh, we, we heard today that God wants to prosper spiritually and financially and physically. But if we cover up our sin, we will not prosper. But he that confesses his sin and what? And forsaketh it. And turns away from it. Turns his back towards it. He that confesses and forsakes his sin, he will find mercy. And that's repentance. Amen? When we repent, we are actually appealing to the mercy of God. And how many have read there in James chapter 2, and I think it's verse 15 or 13. Let's look for it. It says that mercy triumphs or rejoices over what? Over judgment. Go there to James chapter 2. Verse 13, for he shall have judgment without mercy that showeth no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth, rejoiceth, or triumphs against judgment. How do we cancel out the, the divine judgment that weighs heavily upon us or upon our descendants because of our sin? How do we cancel judgment out? By what? By humbling ourselves. Huh? By repenting of our sin. Remember that Elijah came to King, King Acab, Ach, is that his name? Ahab, Ahab. And he confronted him with his sin. And he said, uh, he, de he decreed judgment upon him and upon his lineage. And when Elijah left the house, what did the king do? Though he was a wicked man, no man had sold himself to do such evil. Yet he repented. He humbled himself. He had a contrite heart. He had a repentant heart. And God told Elijah, you go back, right, go, go directly back to that man and tell him that because he's humbled himself, the judgment's not going to fall in his day, but in the day of his children. The judgment was postponed. See, when you appeal to God's mercy through repentance, judgment is either postponed or it's canceled out. Amen? Now, what does sin bring upon us? Judgment. God always judges sin. God doesn't judge people. God judges sin. But by judging sin, he has to what? Judge people. Because people sin. How many understand that tonight? Okay? Now, how are we going to cancel out that judgment that weighs heavily upon us and probably upon our entire family lineage? By what? By repenting. By repenting. You have to repent of not only your own sins, but you have to repent of the sins of your ancestors, of your forefathers. Amen? And when, and when we repent sincerely, wholeheartedly, what are we doing? We're paving the way to divine forgiveness and to divine deliverance. Amen? Amen, brother? Amen. See, repentance leads to deliverance. Repentance is the key to deliverance. No repentance, no deliverance. You're not in that condition by any fortuitous set of circumstances. You're not a victim. We always consider ourselves victims of our circumstances. We're always trying to blame our mother, grandmother, or somebody else for our sorry condition. Let me tell you something, brother. If we are in the condition we find ourselves presently, we are plagued by evil spirits, we are sick, we are troubled, let me tell you something, it's because we have sinned or we have inherited the effects of the sins of our ancestors. Amen? And how are we going to get rid of those demons? Come on now. How are we going to get rid of those demons? Amen. Repent. I tell you, with all the binding and rebuking that's been going on in this camp, everybody here should be rid of all their demons by now. Huh? Every service we're calling out the same names. I, I've only been here 24 hours, a little bit more, and I've already been in three deliverance sessions. 
Why, brethren, we should be the freest people in the world by now. Huh? Isn't that true? But why do those demons hang on to us like leeches? Like eels? Why do they hang on to us? Well, they have legal grounds. They have legal rights. What? How are we given the demons the right to invade us and to plague us? How? Through sin. And you can go through a hundred or a thousand deliverances more and still not be free. I tell you, brethren, if we preach more repentance, we'd have to, we wouldn't have to preach so much deliverance. Hmm? I went to a Bible college and seminary out on the West Coast, and I had a teacher who was a, uh, he was a smart man, bright, graduate of several theological seminaries. He was a Ph.D., Ph.D., and I don't know how many other Ds. Huh? And he had the audacity, he had the nerve of standing up in class in what we call Sodio, 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 uh, the doctrine of salvation. I can't pronounce a lot of words. Soteriology. Right? Is that how you say it? He said, but we don't have to preach the repentance anymore. That was the Jewish doctrine. That was only for the Jews. All we have to preach today is believe, believe, believe. What do we call that? Easy believism. Uh, and we've, we've, we've concocted uh, an evangelistic formula because we want, get, we want to get results. We want to get people that will raise their hand and stand up and come forward. And so we say, how many accept? Do you know that word accept is not in the Bible? Can you show me one verse where we are called to accept God or accept Jesus? There's not, it's nowhere. When the Bible says now is the acceptable time, it means now is the time that God will accept us as we are. We are supposed to be accepted of God, not God accepted of us. We are accepted in the beloved. Amen. The message of the kingdom is repent and believe the gospel. And we left the repent out. And so instead of having a lot of Newborn Christians, we've got a lot of stillborn Christians. <laughs> got a lot of spiritual fetuses around. Right? Not, I hope that doesn't unnerve you, but it's the truth. In a lot of our fundamental churches, holiness churches, Pentecostal churches, there's a lot of people that think they're saved and say they're saved, but they've never had an experience of salvation. Because when you get saved the right way through faith and through obedience and through repentance, <laughs> you're going to have a revolutionary change in your life. And this might shock some deliverance people. If you get saved that way through a real dosis of Bible salvation, through faith and repentance and obedience, a lot of those demons will flee the moment you get saved. Huh? They won't be able to stand it any longer. Yeah, well, I don't know about the holy roller bit. <laughs> Let's just keep the old-fashioned salvation. A lot of that holy roller business was just a lot of excitement. A lot of just an emotional display. Huh? How many believe that? that? That repentance is essential. Repentance is essential. Not only in salvation, but in deliverance. Now let's read 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26. Talking there about the servant of the Lord, that he should, not, he should be meek, that he should correct, that he should instruct. Now it says, them that oppose themselves. In the, the original says, them, them that oppose him, that oppose his ministry. It's talking about people in the church that are rebellious, that they refuse to recognize and submit to his ministry. Amen? Those that oppose. That word oppose is synonymous with the real word rebel. Okay? When you oppose a ministry, and I tell you, there's people here tonight that are opposing my men's message. I get the vibes. Huh? Not, not, not everybody in this building agrees with what I've been teaching about God sending demons. Huh? <laughs> Isn't that true? Come on, be honest with yourself and with God. You've been sitting there resisting, opposing. That's just rebellion. You're a rebellion to the Word of God. Because it differs with what you traditionally believe. Huh? It goes counter to what you've been taught. And so you rebel against it. But what does it say there? That we should be meek, instructing, correcting those that are in rebellion, so that what? That peradventure, God would grant them what? Repentance. Peradventure. Perchance. Huh? See, that's why I believe that counseling is a very important in relationship to deliverance. We can take a person that has a bad attitude, that's in rebellion, and by being patient and meek, we can lead that person to repentance. Huh? Why well, pray for that person till he repents? You're wasting your breath. Uh, you'll scream, you'll howl, you'll do everything. Those demons won't even budge. They'll laugh down their sleeve at you. Uh, amen? 
God says, peradventure, God will grant them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. To the acknowledgement of the truth of their own sad condition. They'll suddenly wake up to the fact that they're in that condition because they're plagued by evil spirits. And what does verse 26 say? And then they'll recover themselves. And that's a poor translation. Huh? The Bible says, and many other translations words use the word escape. Huh? Uh, they'll come to the census and be restored to freedom. They'll recover their freedom. Now, all this time, they've been slaves to what? To evil spirits. The Bible says there that they've been in bondage to Satan. They've been... I'm going to trip over my own <laughs> microphone cord. Oof. Okay, what the, just read verse 26. That they might recover themselves from the snare, the trap of the enemy in which they've been held in bondage at whose will? At Satan's will. Uh, when you rebel, you lose your freedom and your freedom of choice. You lose the, the freedom that God has given you to make your own choices and your own decisions. You become a pawn of Satan. You lose your freedom. You become, you are ensnared by Satan and he can manage you. He can rule you. He can do whatever he wants with you. Amen. Rebels think that they're doing their own thing. They're not doing their own thing. They're doing Satan's thing. Yeah? There's only two major wills in the universe. And what wills are those? God's and Satan's. And you, all you have, to, all you can do with your own will is incline your will either toward God's will or incline your will toward Satan's will. And when you make your own decisions, actually you're leaning toward Satan. You are yielding. You're submitting to Satan because he's the one that has not only rebelled against God, he wants every human being on the face of the earth to rebel against God. Christian and non-Christian. And now see the key to deliverance there in verse 25. For adventure, God will grant them repentance that they might be delivered. That they might be released. That they might be, they might escape from the snare of the enemy. That's why I say that the road to deliverance is repentance. Amen, brethren? And I think instead of calling out demons, Sometimes we should start calling out sins. Huh? I think sometimes we should have just a good repentance meeting uh, instead of deliverance certain meeting, uh, where everyone will... Uh, I tell you, we'd get a thousand times more deliverance if, if tonight we'd open up the meeting and every one of you stood up and confessed your sins. Huh? How would you like that? Uh, we'd have to expose ourselves. We'd have to <laughs> denude ourselves. Huh? We'd strip ourselves bare before the congregation, and that's a very painful thing and shameful thing. Huh? Huh? Would you be willing to confess your pride, pride of looks, huh? pride of family, pride of education, huh? pride of spiritual achievement, spiritual pride? Oh no, we don't like that. So we we just want to go. We just want somebody to get the rid of our demons, uh, but we want to hold on to our sins. Hmm? Amen. Boy, uh, this is getting going longer than I thought. We still haven't gotten in the fourth point, brother. Huh? But I think I think we're we're getting the point, aren't we? Huh? See, most cases of demonization are the result of our own willful sin. We've opened ourselves up to the evil spirit by our attitudes, by our words, by our deeds. We've opened ourselves to the evil spirit. God has been we could use this word, force to send evil spirits. Satan is God's whipping boy. Had you heard that before? Satan is God's whipping boy. Satan many times unwittingly carries out God's judgment upon individuals and families and nations. There's another case I didn't mention tonight, and it's the case of uh, Ahab and Jeroboam. You remember they were making an alliance and they were going out to war, and God was displeased, not with... God was displeased with Jeroboam because he was making alliance with a, such a wicked king. And so, uh, or Jehosh Jehoshaphat, excuse me, Jehoshaphat. And there, there's a scene in, in Second Chronicles chapter 18, the, there's, the heavenlies are open and they, you see God sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven are before him and around him and God says, what are we going to do? And, and uh, one suggested this, another suggested that, and finally a spirit stood up and he said, uh, I suggest this plan. I will be a spirit of lying. Do you think a holy angel is going to offer to be any spirit of lying? Huh? It was an evil spirit that was in God's presence. He said, I'll be a spirit of lying. He said, okay, go and do it. He sent him. 
He offered. He volunteered. But God sent him. Uh, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of spirits in us that have been sent by an act of God. And let me just repeat it and emphasize it. They won't leave till we repent. I, what God's got to give us a sensitivity towards sin. Amen? God's got to give us a consciousness of sin. Uh, God's got to make us aware of the things that have been the cause directly or indirectly of our present condition. And when that happens, then we'll come and say, we have sinned. Now, the Israelites said, we have sinned, and they said to Moses, they can't have to come to Moses, the man they had in the line that they had criticized, they said, now you pray for us. Pray that God will remove these serpents from the camp. Now, did Moses pray for them? Yes. He, he, had, a, a, he had a noble heart. He didn't, try, he didn't feel spite or revenge. He didn't try to get even with them. He didn't say, well, you rascals, after all you've said about me, uh, I'm not going to pray for you. If I pray for you, I'm going to ask God to kill you, all of you. No, he, he prayed for him. But did God answer Moses' prayer? Huh? Not exactly like they wanted him to. Or. What did they want? They wanted God to remove all the demons. Huh? All the serpents. Did God remove them all? He said no. And that's where the, the fourth point comes in. Sin remedy. Uh, what did God do? He said, if I remove all the serpents, both the good and the bad are going to benefit. Huh? And God was going to purge his people. Uh, God was going to purge his people of, of those elements that were always rebelling against him. So what did he do? God made a way out. What was the way? He said, Moses, now you make a serpent of brass and place that serpent on a pole and, and lift the pole in the high strategic part of the camp, right in the center of the camp, so that anybody from any part of the camp can see it. Huh? And so Moses did exactly what God told him. And uh, he, re he, uh, he fabricated that serpent and placed that serpent on a pole. And the Bible says that any man, when he was bitten of the serpent, all he had to do was what? Something very simple. Was look and receive healing, receive deliverance. This was a look of faith. But brethren, remember this. Faith must be preceded by what? Repentance. Repentance must lead up to faith. I'm going to show you a verse, several verses where repentance must come first before faith. And we're going to wrap this up tonight. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. It says here in verse 32, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness and believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe in him. You see that? Ye repented not afterwards that ye might believe in him. How can you believe if you haven't repented? You understand that? Repentance prepares the heart for what? For living faith. Amen? That repentance breaks up the fall of ground so that God can sow the seed of faith in our heart. What we call many times faith is nothing else but mental assent, mental agreement. It's credulity instead of faith. Amen? Oh, I have a lot of people come up to me and say, oh, I've got a lot of faith. And I turn to them and I say, if you had a lot of faith, you wouldn't be in that terrible condition you're in. Huh? But they, they, they confuse faith with something else, like mental agreement or mental consent. Faith it cannot be birthed in a heart that is uh, full of sin. Sin will destroy faith. Amen? Sin will cancel out faith. Sin will short-circuit faith. So sin has to be gotten rid of before faith can be born in our hearts. Amen? That's why when Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom and deliverance is a part of the message of the kingdom, isn't that true? If I, by the Spirit of God, I mean deliverance, if I, by the Spirit of God, cast out devils, then what? The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. So deliverance is part of the message of the kingdom. Deliverance is one of the benefits of the kingdom of God. And how do we enter into the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is drawn nigh, therefore what? Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and then exercise your faith. If you don't repent, you're not going to be able to exercise your faith. Your faith will be so weak and so puny that it won't rise above the ceiling. And all the benefits of Calvary from salvation to healing delivered 
are the result, the direct result of faith, of exercising living faith in the living Christ. Amen? You don't get deliverance unless you have faith. A lot of people come to a meeting like this to see if perchance they can get some deliverance. They're just trying out to see if perchance they can get free. Brethren, that's not faith. You should come to a meeting like this not only determined but convinced that you're going to get help, that you're going to get deliverance. That's faith. You should come to a meeting like this so sure of what the Scripture says that you know that when you leave this meeting, you're going to leave here without those demons that have plagued you for decades. Amen? See, faith is only born in a repentant heart. And I can show many, many Scriptures. You can see it in, uh, in Acts chapter 20 when Paul was speaking to the Ephesian elder. He said, preaching repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's many, many scriptures that show that repentance must come first. And if there's no repentance, there's no true faith. Now, the Bible says that, that Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert. And the serpent in the desert, according to John chapter 3, is symbolic of what? Of the crucified Christ. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of, God must, the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him. See? Not only will be saved, but healed, delivered, will enter into all the benefits of Christ's redemptive work on Calvary. But before we can exercise faith, we can believe, we can have Bible faith, we're going to have to repent. And the reason why I'm re emphasizing repentance, brethren, is because we've been fed faith for years. But it hasn't, it's been to no avail, it just hasn't worked. And I've traveled this country from coast to coast and border to border, the Lord's opened so many doors in so many different groups and denominations. It's amazing. Because I preach from the dead, dry fundamentals all the way to the radical Pentecostals, the wild-eyed Pentecostals. I get invited to all these groups. Discipleship, divine order, deliverance, sonship, and everything. And one thing I've found, brethren, is that a lot of lives have been shattered by the faith message. Because they've, they've tried to exercise their faith and they've claimed, and they've believed, and they've confessed, and they've agreed, and they've done everything they can to get what they need, and nothing happened. Why? Because repentance has been lacking. Amen? Okay? Now, who is the answer to any of our needs? Physical, moral, emotional, or spiritual? Jesus Christ. He is the deliverer. And he was lifted up high. He was lifted above the earth. He was lifted on the cross. He became a curse so that we could become a blessing. Amen? He died so that we could live. Now, this is the message the world needs to hear. That's why in Isaiah 45, 22, it says, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. That's the look of faith. Amen? We have to look upon Christ as he suffered and died in our behalf, as our substitute, as our representative. He died so that we could, be lived, we could live a life of abundance and victory and freedom through Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes. That's why in many places of the Bible, for example, in Hebrews chapter 12, it says what? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen? Colossians 3 says that we shouldn't set our eyes on the things below, but we should set our eyes on the things above where Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. We should put our eyes on whom? Oh, not on Brother Glenn Miller. Not on Brother Dempsey Thomas. Not on Brother Norman Parrish. Not on Brother Walter Pittman. Or Willard Pittman. Howard Pittman. Boy, I'm having, I'm having more trouble with you, brother. <laughs> I don't know what's happened. There's, I, I hope it doesn't happen. I'm embarrassed. Maybe you're going to have to pray for me. <laughs> but listen to this. Don't put your eyes on any man. Put your eyes on Jesus. And if you meet the requirements that God has laid down, what are those requirements? Huh? Repentance. And this could mean that you must confess your sin not only before God, but before whom? Before God's people. The Bible says, confess your sin one to another and pray one for another that ye might be healed. And that word healing includes salvation, healing, deliverance, and preservation of life. The whole package. Uh, there are certain sins that you must confess, privately or publicly, as the Spirit would lead you. If your sin has been committed in private and no one knows about it, you can go to one, a man of God and confess it. And he might say, well, you've got to confess this to your wife. 
you might have to, or you'll have to confess this to your church. For brethren, there are sins that have to be brought out into the open, no matter what the shame and the pain might be. Let me tell you something. One of the reasons why the churches today are plagued by evil spirits is the lack of correction and discipline in the body of Christ. There's a tolerant attitude towards sin, and people sin and get away with it. No one wants to exercise proper authority and put somebody on probation. How many of when was the last time you heard of anybody putting, being put on probation in your church, in your fellowship, in your group? Huh? We accept abortion, we accept divorce, we accept, accept everything. Everything's condoned today in the body of Christ. No wonder the church is demonized. Amen? But when sin is confessed and sin is corrected, let me tell you something, brethren, the results are what? Freedom. How many want to come into freedom? How many want to be delivered of all those things that are, are troubling you and harassing you and plaguing you? And oppressing you. Well, brethren, what you need is, is repentance. And why don't we start tonight? Amen? Why don't we start tonight? I don't have to place words in your mouth. You people are Christians. Some of you have been Christians for many years. Why am I going to put you through a, a mechanical prayer? Until you repeat this prayer with me. You know how to pray. Let the Spirit of God come upon you. Let the Spirit of God reprove you. Let the Spirit of God convict you. Let the Spirit of God pierce you through. Let the Spirit of God deal with your sin. Let the Spirit of God point out your sin. Let the Spirit of God dig up that sin that you've hidden in the coffin. Let the Spirit of God make you aware of the sin that has opened the door to all these miserable spirits that today are causing you defeat and sorrow. Huh? Let the Spirit of God deal with you tonight. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and do His work in our midst. Amen? The Bible says that when He, the Comforter, should come, the spirit of truth shall come. He shall reprove the world of sin. <coughs> and brethren, if the world needs to be reproved of sin, how much more the church needs to be reproved of sin. Now, I'm not the one to, to accuse you. I'd be usurping the place of the Holy Ghost. I have no right to stand up here and point fingers at anybody. If I pointed one finger at you, I'd have to point four at myself. Amen? But you know, there's someone here present tonight that not only can do that, huh? But must do that. That's the Holy Spirit. We talk about the power and we talk about the glory and we talk about the marvelous presence of the Spirit of God in our meeting. I'll tell you, brethren, when the Spirit is truly manifested in our midst, there'll be more brokenness before God. Huh? There'll be more humility before God. There'll be more repentance before God. There'll be more contrition before God. Amen? Do you believe that? Yeah. A lot of people confuse God's blessing with the giddiness that sometimes we have in our meetings. We jump, we laugh, we cry, we clap, and we dance, and we say, that's the glory. Brethren, if we need a revival in America, the revival will come how? When God's people really get down to business with God and repent. Amen? Now, just close your eyes before the Lord. I don't know what the Lord wants to do tonight, but I wouldn't waste my time rebuking demons. Oh, that's been done all week. Huh? That's been done all week, night after night, meeting after meeting. We've been binding rebuking, commanding. We've been trying to drag those demons up. And they just won't move. They're holding out uh, uh, holding out for dear life. Why? Ah, uh, because we've got to get things right with God. Why don't we start tonight? Why don't we finish this year, this year 1984, make, wiping the slate clean? Amen? God, get rid of the sins not only committed this week, this month, this year, but the sins that have been committed down through the, the, our past life. Let the Lord speak to you tonight. The Lord doesn't do it. <laughs> There's no use me trying to do it. We need to experience sorrow. We need to experience remorse. The Bible says that godly sorrow leadeth to repentance. Amen? Godly sorrow leadeth to repentance. We need to cry out to God for our sins. I had an unusual experience recently. I was, we were driving down a highway, and a young man was, was riding with me in the car, and he began to open his heart and tell me about his past, about his past sinful past, about all the ugly incidents in, in his past life, huh? about adultery and abortion and a lot of things that had gone on. And suddenly the Spirit of God began to deal with him. He began to cry. I was driving 60 miles an hour. And when he began to cry, he began to rebuke. And we had a deliverance session right there on the highway, driving 60 miles an hour. I didn't pull over. I didn't stop. I just kept on driving and kept on rebuking. Now, why did he get a good dose of deliverance? Why do you think he did? Because he repented. I tell you, brother, when we repent, those demons will come tumbling out of us. Huh? 
they'll be so desperate to leave that you'll you'll just have to get out of the way and let them let them flee. But I get so tired of just binding and binding, rebuking and rebuking and getting nowhere. Let the Spirit of God deal with you tonight. I think we need to have an, a self examination. Now I don't think in in some morbid sort of introspection. Let the Spirit of God point out those areas of your life that you haven't cleaned up. Let the Spirit of God point out those sins that you have harbored and that you have loved. Sin, especially of a carnal nature, is pleasurable. And it's so hard to, con be con to, be to become convinced that it's sinful because it gives us a certain measure of pleasure and joy, at least earthly joy. Just let the Spirit of God speak to you. Invite the Holy Spirit into your life. Not only to fill you and anoint, it, but anoint you, but to reprove you of anything that is disagreeable to God. God might be wroth. God might be angry. God might be displeased. God might be provoked to wrath by the way you have lived. By your thoughts, your words, your actions, your attitudes, your relationships. Whatever it may, might be, get rid of it tonight. Determine within your own heart and mind that you're going to get rid of that thing that's blighting your life. It's not the demons that are destroying you. It's, this, it's your sin that's destroying you. Did you hear that? Not the devil that's destroying you. It's your sin that's destroying you. Because if it wasn't for your sin, the devil wouldn't have any access to your inner man. There'd be no way he could creep in. There'd be no way he could sneak in. So get rid of your sins. And by getting rid of your sins, you're going to get rid of your demons. You might need ministry. You might have to be prayed for. I'm not dismissing that. But I'll tell you something, brethren. When we get right with God, we're setting the stage for a fast and full deliverance. I don't see why people have to go on for two and three and four years being delivered. Meeting after meeting. Workshop after workshop. The same demons cropping up. The same demons screaming and kicking and thrashing and carrying on something terrible. Just let God do what he wants to. Why don't we get on our knees? I think that'd be a better position. Just let's get on our knees. <laughs> Just pretend tonight that you're alone with God. You're in the presence of Almighty God. You're in the presence of the high and lofty God, the Holy God of Israel. Just open your heart to Him. And just say, Lord, for the first time in my life, I want to be honest. I want to be sincere. Just take off your mask. Take, take off your disguise. Take up your robe of self-righteousness and strip yourself, bear yourself before God tonight. Call your sins out by name. Don't just say, Lord, I've sinned. He knows that. But just mention your sins by name. Enumerate them. List them. Confess them just the same way you committed them. One by one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be honest. To be frank. Yes, Lord. Give us a good doses of repentance tonight, Lord. Break us. Reprove us. Humble us in your presence. God's doing a deep work in many lives tonight. We're setting the stage for a real act of deliverance. It might be tonight. It might be tomorrow. In God's appointed time, we're going to have deliverance. And people that have been seeking for deliverance for months, for years, are going to come into deliverance before this camp is over. If and when you set the record straight with God. Hallelujah. Blessed Jesus. Hallelujah. Now obey the Spirit of God. If there's something you need to settle, you need to correct between you and some brother or sister that's here present tonight, get off your knees and go over to that person. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for cleansing. If your mother, your father's here, your husband, your wife is here, your pastor is here. <coughs> if there's something standing in the way, just go up to that person and ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness. Just do it. If you've rebelled against your parents, if you've rebelled against your husband, if you've rebelled against your pastor or your group leader, why don't you go up to them tonight and say, I repent. Make amends. Determine in your own life and heart that this is never going to happen again. It's never going to be repeated. That's it. There are several that are beginning to obey God. Why don't you obey God too? The Spirit of God might lead you to stand up tonight and, and voice your repentance. Speak out and confess that you've been a hypocrite. Speak out and confess that you pretended to be a spiritual Christian or a faithful Christian. You obey the Spirit. Be sensitive to the Spirit. 
Be prudent. Be wise in what you say. But if you obey the Spirit of God, you'll get relief. The Spirit of God might be telling you there's something that you must do something. And it's going to take a lot of grace and courage to do it. But the Bible says that His grace is sufficient for every situation. And if the Lord is directing you to make public confession tonight, do it. In the name of Jesus, do it. Don't, don't hold back from God. Just do it in the name of Jesus Christ. He will honor you for it. Do whatever the Spirit of God is telling you to do. And you'll feel a heavy little cloud of oppression lift. That burden will go. All the guilt, all the condemnation you've been under for months, for years, will suddenly dissipate if you'll obey the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. There's a difference between confessing the Lord Jesus Christ and confessing sin. Tonight, what the Lord wants us to do is confessing our sin. You've already confessed Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord. Now get up and confess your sin, if the Spirit of God directs you to do that. I'm not forcing anybody. I'm not cursing anybody to do it. You just do what God tells you to do. Make them things right. Make amends. You might have to make a telephone call tonight. You might have to write a letter. You might have to make a trip. Who knows what God's going to ask you to do? Yes. The road out of rebellion is through obedience. If the Lord is telling you to get in touch with somebody that you've maligned, somebody that you've uh, rebelled against, you better do that. There will be no deliverance till you obey the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. This camp can be the most glorious deliverance camp ever if everybody within the sound of my voice would obey the Spirit of God. Whatever the requirement might be, a call, a letter, a visit, an interview, yes. Just do what God tells you to do. The Lord bless you. The Lord release you from those sins. The Bible says that God has given us power to forgive sin, to remit sin. We do that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's bitterness and resentment. There's anger in your heart. Confess it before, Lord and if, before the Lord and if necessary before the people. You just obey God. And you'll be released tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your sins will be washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. You'll be spotless before God and blameless before God tonight if you obey the Spirit of the living God. Hallelujah. Several, several have obeyed God. And I know it's going to be a night of victory for them. <coughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother, you are released from that Guilt and shame in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive his forgiveness. Receive his cleansing. Let the Spirit of God apply the blood of Jesus Christ to your soul. Hallelujah. Things are happening around the building. God moves in mysterious ways, in quiet ways. His wonders to perform. Yes. I think there's some wives that should get up and <clears throat> approach their husbands and ask for forgiveness. And there's husbands that should approach their wives and ask for forgiveness for their bad attitude, for their domineering attitude. Yes. You know what's wrong. I, you don't have to be told. Yes, the Lord purify your soul, my brother, your mind. May the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ flow through you tonight in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God is dealing with people here tonight. That's it. Yes. That is a sin. You know, <clears throat> to take the tithe and use it for your own purposes is a sin before God. And you're released from that sin in the name of Jesus. May God give you strength and courage to obey the, what the Word explicitly says about giving so that you'll open the doorway of prosperity and wealth in the name of Jesus. That's it. Renounce it, brother. Renounce it. Just go and destroy whatever cigarette you have. Flush them down the commode. Throw them in the garbage. And determine in the name of Jesus that that nicotine spirit, that cigarette spirit's not going to have a hold on you any longer. Be free from that filthy habit in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. This is an unusual service. The way it's turned out was not premeditated. We didn't plan it this way. But you let the Lord... Deal with you. Speak to you. Whatever it might be. Hallelujah. A lot of people are getting victory tonight. Yes, we're going to have a good shouting time in a moment. Blessed be the name of the Lord.
We can claim victory. We can proc- we can pronounce victory in our own lives. In Jesus' name. Bless you. Bless you, Lord Jesus. Yes. Amen. God bless you, sister. Let the humbling influence of the Holy Ghost enter your life. That you may be molded into the image of Christ. Meekness, humility. Hallelujah. Blessed Jesus. Hallelujah. You might be led of the Spirit of God tonight to go and pray for somebody. Why don't you do that tonight? Uh, there's somebody that might need, need your prayers. Why don't you, why don't we all stand and, and let the Spirit of God lead you to someone that you know has been going through a difficult time? Yes. Let's pray one for another. That's what the Bible says. Pray one for another. That she might be healed. If there's been repentance, if there's been confession tonight, now's the time that we can pray for one another. Just walk up to somebody. Let the Spirit of God show you whom. Somebody that might need a loving embrace. That might need a word of encouragement. That might need that prayer right at this moment. To be released from something that's been clinging to them. Why don't you walk up to somebody and put your arm around that person. Yes, identify with that person. That's it. Don't stand there still. Don't stand like a... Don't wait for somebody to come up to you. Why don't you go to somebody? That's it. Young and old. Some of our the children can go up to the elderly and vice versa. That's it. Just minister love. Minister grace. Minister forgiveness. Minister cleansing through the blood of Jesus Christ. Just go up and hug somebody. Bless somebody in the name of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Bring release to their soul. People are troubled. Yes. Sometimes there's shyness. Sometimes there's fear. Sometimes there's apprehension. Just walk up to that person. There's several need help here tonight. Why don't you go minister to that person? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory, glory, glory. Yes, there's several people standing by that need some help. Let the Spirit of God lead you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for you and your ministry. Let that burden lift. Let that deep cloud of oppression be dispelled upon your life tonight. Be free, be free, be free in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Free of guilt. Free of shame. Free of rejection. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Be free. Glory. Glory. People are getting deliverance tonight. Might be in a different manner, but who cares? Who cares how the demons come out as long as they come out? That's the important thing. Blessed Jesus. The service is dismissed, so just go around blessing people, fellowshipping, helping each other in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.